I love how it takes us through the Gospel. The birth of Jesus. The life of Jesus. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Which provokes praise. Mixing things up a little bit this morning because as I'm preaching on singing, I thought it would be good to give the lesson and then have the lab. Give the lesson and then have the lab. We'll go to the lab after this. Take up what we learn from this passage. Last week we began a series that will go through the month of December, God willing. Wishing you and yours a spirit-filled Christmas. There's a lot of different Christmas wishes floating around at this time of year. All of them, all of them good, really. But this is, this is the best that I can wish for, for you and for me and for mine. A spirit-filled Christmas, because you know as well as I do, you can go completely through this season and miss the real reason for the season. And we don't want to do that. We want to keep in our uppermost mind that Jesus is the reason for the season. So we began studying last week in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 15 to 21. We looked at verses 15, 16, 17, and 18. We're going to read the passage again together today. I'm going to focus in on the first part of verse 19. Singing to one another. If you found Ephesians 5, 15 to 21 in your Bibles, uh, stand with me if you would. And if you don't have a Bible, have access to one. We're going to put the text on the screen but it would be a great idea at this season of the year for you to ask someone to give you a Bible for Christmas. It would be a great gift to get. Follow along as I read these verses. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. And we told you last week, keep on being filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. What have I just read to you? We just read together the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And as we study this today, it's my desire that this passage would, would remind us that we have a reason to sing. Uh, you, may not, you may not like the way you sound when you sing. You may not like the, all the selection of songs <laughs> available to sing, but you have a reason to sing. He's put a song in our hearts when He saves us. And that you would recognize that, that as much as you and I who are saved by grace need to sing, The church, your brothers and sisters in Christ need to hear you sing. Thank you. Please be seated. We're going to move through this series. As I said, we looked last week, Walking Wise in Evil Times. Today, singing to one another. Next week, Lord willing, singing to the Lord. Uh, The following week, always giving thanks. And then finally, on December 29th, submitting to one another. I came across an article this week, very providentially, entitled, Your Church Needs You to Sing. It's by a pastor out of St. Paul, Minnesota. Listen to this. Your brothers and sisters in your local church need you. They need you to show up. They need you to be engaged. And perhaps more than many of us realize, they need you to sing. Congregational singing can be polarizing. For some people, singing is their favorite part of the church's gathering. Others prefer to arrive on Sunday mornings just after the worship team is wrapping up and the sermon is about to begin. For those in the latter category, perhaps you're highly self-conscious about your lack of ability to carry a tune. Or maybe you just don't jibe with the style of music your church's hipster music director tends to choose. Thank God we don't have a hipster music director. Whatever the reason, I want you to hear that your church suffers when your voice is silent. The Bible is full of singing and songs. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if God's divine speech by which He spoke the world into existence sounded more like a song than a seminar. Adam's first words to Eve are beautifully poetic. The largest book in the Bible is a collection of songs. At least once, if not more often, the Apostle Paul quotes or crafts what seems to be an early Christian hymn. And Jesus Himself sang. 
And for good reason. Singing uniquely engages our heads and our hearts, our intellect and our affections. That's basically what Paul says in Colossians 3.16 where he connects the Word of Christ dwelling in you richly with singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Good songs take the truths hovering in our heads and sink them down for our hearts to dwell on. Did you hear that? The truths hovering in our heads and sinks them down for our hearts to dwell on. We experience the power of singing in songs like Horatio Spafford's famous It Is Well With My Soul. As we sing the third verse, we cannot help but feel the solemnity of the line, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Yet suddenly the minors of the first half of the verse give way to the bright major chords of the second half, and we confidently declare, It is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. And as we sing, we feel the major lift of the music raise our hearts to soar in proportion with the glory of that truth. Sure, we could speak the lyrics, and the truth in them should still move us to worship, but the elements of rhythm and melody arrest our affections in transformative ways not typical of speech alone. But congregational singing isn't only about you and engaging your emotions. It is that. But there is more. In Colossians 3.16, Paul also instructs the church to continue teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And he implies that congregational singing is one of the means of doing so. In Ephesians 5.19, Paul makes the implication of Colossians 3.16 explicit, telling the church to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing is vital to the edification of the church. And it's not enough that, you, that just a few people sing. Paul is telling you to sing for the benefit of your brothers and sisters. But how does your voice benefit your church? Especially if your singing voice sounds like a dog's howl. That's, I'm reading the article. I didn't say that. The power of your participation in congregational singing is not in the quality of your tone, but in the voice's testimony to God's faithfulness. Your participation in singing signifies to all those around you that you love Jesus and trust His gospel. By hardly singing, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You are exhorting those around you to lay hold of that precious truth. By singing of your sin and salvation, you're instructing your church, spouse, children, friends, and neighbors in gospel truth. What about when you don't feel like singing though? When your soul is downcast? and your faith is diminished. These are the times when your church needs your voice the most. The Gospel is on full display in our weakness. When all is going well for you and life is sailing smoothly along, you should sing. But it's less surprising when you do. When all is going well, it is surprising when you don't sing. But when life is falling apart and trials threaten your security, when you're singing, becomes a forceful testimony, forceful testimony to the faithfulness of God. In your church, the most prominent leaders of congregational song may be up front on a platform, but the most prominent leaders aren't always the most powerful leaders. In fact, in my years as a worship pastor, I've found that the most powerful leaders of congregational worship are almost always found in the pews. Listen to his description. The expecting mother who suffered a devastating miscarriage the day before. But through the tears sings out, In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. The young professional who because of his Christian convictions on sexuality was fired from his dream job on Friday, but who arrives on Sunday and belts out how firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in His excellent word. The divorced woman battling loneliness and depression, who declares, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him over and over. The 76-year-old husband and wife who recently buried their youngest daughter and two granddaughters but still sit in the second row on Sunday morning as they have for the past 40 years and cry out, He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. These are the folks whose singing can spur on my faith as much as any sermon. 
their act of declaring the faithfulness of God through their participation in the church's songs makes me love the truth we are singing with affections that I could never muster if I were singing on my own. The songs of suffering saints speak life to my soul. So when the music starts this weekend, don't underestimate what happens as you sing. You're engaging your heart, teaching those around you and receiving teaching and declaring God's faithfulness. The simple act of lifting your voice in song may well be the most significant way you serve your church this Sunday. It's a great exhortation to us, isn't it? I want us to think of two things as we look at this verse, half of this verse today. First, being filled with the Spirit and addressing one another. We're, we're going through a larger series, uh, one anothering, living in a gospel community. And this is one of those passages that addresses the one another's. And second, being filled with the Spirit expressed by singing. First of all, being filled with the Spirit and addressing one another. Our text says we are to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That should tell us, we should be taught by that, that worship is not primarily an individual experience. Yes, you should all have your, cl your closet worship, your private times of devotion. But we were not made to live alone, so we were not made to worship alone. In heaven, part of the heavenness of heaven, will be gathered for all eternity around the throne, singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy art thou, O God, to receive blessing and honor and power and glory. Together, voices lifted up. I look forward to heaven for many reasons. One of them is that the Lord will tune my voice to sing in the heavenly places. I'm looking forward to that. We're to address one another. So it's not a private matter. Worship is not a private matter. Yes, you should receive benefit from worship through the various means of grace employed. You should receive benefit when, when we sing. You should be taught, as we've already read. Your heart, if you pick up your voice and sing, will be filled. What you know in your head will sink deeper into your heart and grip you and shape you. The means of reading Scripture and prayer and preaching all ought to have benefit for you. But it's mutual benefit. True gathering corporate worship never thinks primarily about me. It thinks about us, the plural pronoun. And so we're to address one another. That's part of our one anothering. If you're going to practice one anothering, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. If we're going to practice one anothering, we will take up songs for one another. We will sing for one another. We will address one another in these ways. One commentator said, believers will not only be enlightened being filled with the Spirit and joyful, but will also give jubilant expression to their refreshing knowledge of the will of God. They will reveal their discoveries and their feelings of gratitude. So Paul says we're to speak to one another. We read earlier Colossians 3, 12 to 17. I just remind you, verse 16, which speaks the same thing Ephesians 5, 19 does, admonishes us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How do you do that? How does the word of Christ dwell in you richly? We've talked about that. Scripture memory is one of those ways. Reading the scripture regularly, sitting under teaching and preaching. But singing is also a way. And here's the thing I challenge you. Whatever era you grew up in, I can be driving down the road and a song come on the radio, whether it's one that, that Karen and I were listening to in the 60s, uh, like the Strawberry Alarm Clock, I think was one of the, I can, that, the intro that incense and peppermint can come on and I know the words. In other words, music is very powerful. Martin Luther said, he said, let the Pope's men write the theologies. I'll write the hymns. He knew the power of music. It's a great instructor too. The Word of Christ dwelling in you richly is by singing, by listening to singing. And you'll be amazed at how much you remember and retain. We teach our children at the earliest ages, I like to go to church. I 
like to go to church. I like the happy songs we sing. I like to go to church. You tie the delight in attendance with singing. It's the right thing to do. Word of Christ dwelling in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Wisdom is found in, in good lyrics. And Joshua's very careful here. We don't pick bad lyrics here. In the early days, he and I worked closely together. Now, I simply review what he's doing because he's got a good theological mind and he's been blessed to grow up around, uh, exclude me from this, but some of the greatest preachers on the planet. He's learned good theology. And all of our lyrics here, no matter what genre, are solid, sound lyrics. They're worthy of teaching one another and admonishing one another. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. God giving you anything to be thankful for? Sing. Sing. One writer said the term psalms in all probability has reference at least mainly to the Old Testament Psalter, book of Psalms. Hymns, mainly to New Testament songs of praise to God and to Christ. And finally, spiritual songs, mainly to sacred lyrics dwelling on themes other than direct praise to God or to Christ. And there may be some overlap in that. But the point is, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, we talk about ransacking the arsenal of praise to God. By means of these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, spirit-filled believers must speak to each other aloud. Aloud. Then the next thing I want us to see is being filled with the Spirit expressed by singing. As we sing songs, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Do you realize that the first reference to singing in the Bible, if I were to ask you where that was, you might not catch it, but it's in the Exodus 15, 1 and following. The Mo Moses and the people of God have been delivered. Been delivered. They sang this song to the Lord saying, I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider He has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. And it goes on for a full 20, 18 verses. 18 verses. When they finish singing, then Miriam, Moses' sister, sang, Sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider... He is thrown into the sea. There's, there's this, you cannot help but sing. Folks, they're, they're singing because they've been delivered from Egyptian bondage. You and I have been delivered from hell. If they had reason to sing, we much more so. The angels sing continually, yet they will never know grace. We know grace. If the angels have reason to sing, we much more so. And it's interesting, when you get toward the end of the Bible, Revelation 15, you read this. In verse 3, and they sing the song of Moses. The Bible closes out with people in heaven. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. I was not in Edmond last night, but I would imagine the crowd that was there to see the Owasso High School Rams complete an undefeated season as state champions, I doubt that they were sitting in the stands sedate, going, well, this is good. It's been a good season. I would imagine not a few people left that place with their voices strained. And I would commend that. Their team had won a great victory. Our team, our high school, done something it's, I don't think it's ever done before if I've read the reports properly. Amazing. Beating the best. Well, folks, our God is the champion. He has conquered sin and death and hell and the grave for us. Surely, surely we can summon 
some level of emotions to lift up voices in praise to God, honoring Him. Getting ready, by the way, to sing in heaven. In heaven, we're going to sing. We're going to sing. The Scripture speaks in several places, and I'm just going to hit them real quickly because I'm going to wrap this up so we can go into our lab here in a few minutes. Several places. In the Psalms. 33.3 Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Psalm 40, verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Psalm 96.1 Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Psalm 98.1 Oh, sing to the Lord a new song for He has done marvelous things. His right hand, His holy arm have worked salvation for Him. Psalm 144.9 I will sing a new song to you, O God. Upon a ten-stringed harp I will play to you. Psalm 149.1 Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. Isaiah 42.10 Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants. And then in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Two of my favorite chapters in all the Scripture. Revelation 4, Revelation 5. Read them soon. Read over them and rejoice in them. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Joshua's introduced us in recent days to a, to a, a new song based on this text. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Then Revelation 14, 3, And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Nobody sings like the redeemed sing. Nobody has greater motivation to sing than the blood-bought ones sing. Oh, brothers and sisters, for the glory of God, because He inhabits the praise of His people, for the name of Christ, that people might be convinced that we have a Savior who we delight in, who is worthy of all of our energies, all of our resources, all of our being. Sing. That others sitting around you who may be wondering whether God is real or not. Are we just going through the motions here? Sing. That they might be gripped, if not by their own convictions, gripped by your convictions. Ben Franklin was running out of his office one time and his, his employee said, where are you going, Mr. Franklin? He said, I'm going to hear Mr. Whitfield preach. And they said, you don't believe what Mr. Whitfield preaches? Said, no, but he sure does. He sure does. Sing as if you believe it. Sing that you might teach someone nearby. Sing that you might remind your, your weary soul that we have a reason to sing. He's put a new song in our hearts. Oh, brothers and sisters, the glory of God, the name of Christ, the sake of the gospel, your ministry of well-being to others, and the ministry to your own soul. Sing. This is a season where a lot of singing goes on. Don't miss those opportunities. Lead the way. Sing with all your heart. Let's pray. And Joshua will come and lead us to sing. Dear Holy Father, You're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know, according to Your Word and by the ministry of Your Holy Spirit in our lives, that we'd have no real reason to sing and we'd have nothing of substance to sing had you not given us a new heart in the gospel. Taking away the heart of stone, giving us a heart of flesh. Renewing a right spirit within us. Transforming our minds. Reshaping our hearts. Giving us peace with you. Enabling us to have peace with each other. Oh God. Help us to practice one anothering now, perhaps in a way that collectively we have not done this, not with the intensity before. Oh God, 
Fill us with your spirit even now that we might be singing to one another, speaking these wonderful truths in song. Fill us with your spirit that we might bless one another and demonstrate to any who hear, we love you, Lord. We lift our voice to praise you with all that we are. But you did not spare your own son, but gave him up for us all. We ask this in the sweet, wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.